Hello, everybody, and welcome to The Seventh Rule with Sirach Lofton. Hello, hello. We are also joined by extremely special guest, writer, producer, director, Mr. Mark Zikri. Hi, guys. Also known as Mr. Sci-Fi. Check him out on YouTube, Mr. Sci-Fi on YouTube. Uh, my name is Ryan T. Husk. Today, we are going to talk about Mark Zikri and all of his awesome projects of yesteryear and present. Uh, first of all, we want to say check out Space Command. You can find it on Kickstarter. They're doing a Kickstarter right now for their fourth episode. Each one is an hour long. Uh, really awesome stuff. Tons of amazing actors like uh, Doug Jones, Mara Furlong, Bill Moomy, Bruce Boxleitner, Ferran Tahir, all kinds of good ones. Before we get into right. that, yeah. I know we got a ton. <laughs> Before we get into that, let's talk about your career. And you, you've done so much cool and amazing stuff. First of all, Star Trek fans, you know him. Sorak, you know him as the guy that wrote Far Beyond the Stars on Deep Space Nine. So can we just yeah. start with that incredible episode and kind of your inspiration behind it? Sure, of course. And I came up with the initial notion. Uh, I grew up with the original Star Trek and uh, those writers on that show were my heroes. So as soon as I was a teenager, I started meeting them, people like Harlan Ellison, Theodore Sturgeon, and Dorothy Fontana, and David Gerald, and so forth. And uh, and with Theodore Sturgeon, he became a mentor. And uh, I noticed that although he was one of my idols, and he'd written some of the great science fiction of both television and uh, books and short stories, that he was living this little impoverished life. And I realized those guys who wrote the classic science fiction of the 50s were doing it for the love of it. They were writing for a penny a word, five cents a word, and that world that would, if not for them, we wouldn't have Star Trek or or Star Wars or any of this stuff that's come come since. And uh, they inspired everything. And uh, so I wanted to show that world. And um, so I came up with it and I pitched it. It took a year for it to sell. And by then, then I was uh, producing Sliders. I was a writer producer on Sliders. And so, um, uh, hey Mark, one second. Hey Mark, one second. Sorry. Um, can you, um, can you, you have any ear? You have any ear? Sure. Yeah. Yeah, I can do let's, that. Absolutely. Let's use those. Thanks. That'll help a little bit, I think. Um, yeah. And it's here. funny when you mentioned Theodore Sturgeon while you're getting those, uh, you actually, the, I'm, I act in Space Command too. And my character is named yeah. after it's Theodore named Sturgeon. After Theodore Sturgeon. Sturgeon. Yes. Like so much. Um, and yeah. I'm ashamed to say that when I was talking about Theodore Sturgeon and Space Command on a different podcast on Orville Nation, I couldn't remember where you got the name. I said, I'm sure it's a writer, but I don't remember what he wrote. Can you remind us what he did write? Yes, yes. Um, Much better, by the way. We hear you great. Oh, great. Terrific. So um, Ted Sturgeon wrote uh, on Star Trek, he wrote the episodes of Muck Time and mm. Surely. What Muck Time is a great episode where Spock has to go back to Vulcan to, to essentially to spawn. And... Uh, mm. <laughs> I was watching you, Sirach. <laughs> you, you're like, wait a minute. He just stopped talking. No, I, I actually wrote down Shorely because that's the name of one of the conventions. And I oh, guess it's, right. a, it's the name of an episode, which I just learned. Yeah. So, so that, was, that was good information for me right there, Theodore Sturgeon. So you, the character you played was Theodore Sturgeon? Yeah, uh, I'm still playing. Uh, for those of you at home right now, is it Kree's? There. Oh, there we go. There, yeah, gotcha. So, um, that's I said, cool. so. Ted Sturgeon wrote, <laughs> trying to get this to work so I can hear you guys. Actually, we see a lot, see and hear you a lot better now. So whatever you did is, is perfect. So go ahead and finish your story. Terrific. So um, basically, Ted's there. Now I can hear my hear, hear all of this. Uh, Ted Sturgeon wrote Amok Time and Shore Leaves. Shore Leaves is the one where the, the, the giant white rabbit from Alice in Wonderland appears on this uh, planet they're taking shore leave on <clears throat> and amok time was the great second season episode where spock has to go back to vulcan and he's in his spawning spawning craziness and you know thinks he kills kirk and all that great episodes in terms of uh short stories and novels he wrote a saucer of loneliness which is a great short story and he also wrote more than human a novel um uh the synthetic man tons of great great books he was a wonderful writer and if you aren't uh -huh. aware of his work definitely you should uh you should check check it out mm-hmm mm -hmm. Cool. And so then that's, and then you start kind of getting into a writing for Star Trek yourself. First, you wrote uh, yes. Star Trek First Contact, and that's the Next Generation episode, not. Yeah. Uh, I came up with, yeah, I came up with the idea that, you know, the Enterprise would make first contact to a, to a society that had uh, developed the warp drive. And it, it was, you know, I was very proud of it. But then Far Beyond the Stars, 
you know, when I came up with that and the idea that all the actors would play these science fiction writers back in the 50s, uh, the, you know, it was also because Armin Shimmerman was a very good friend of mine. I'm just looking to plug this in. <laughs> you look like you're playing piano at the same time. Really? <laughs> really? <laughs> so hang on, I'll just do this. I'm just uh, technology, the wonders of technology. Here we go. Okay, Perfect. that should, uh, let's see. Um, okay, great. So um, it was basically the idea that we would see Ar Armin Shimon was a friend Ar and the fact that he could play a role without the makeup, that the fact that you would see all the actors for the first time, uh, René Auberginois, et cetera, was very thrilling. And then the idea of it being about race, because the moment that you put um, Jake Sisko into it, you know, and, and, and Ben, you know, uh, it, be it be invariably becomes about race in the 1950s. And, and that was a brilliant idea. And that was, um, uh, Rene Obers, I'm sorry, Ira Bear suggested that, and I immediately thought it was brilliant. So I outlined the story in detail, and um, and then uh, and then Hans Beimler and Ira Bear wrote the script from from based, you know from that outline, and uh, it was it was a thrilling experience. The only reason I didn't write the script was because I was writing two episodes of Sliders back to back, and uh, so I had you were to. Were also executive producer on there, weren't you? Yeah, I was a producer on the show. Yeah, absolutely. So. Um, but it was great. I was two, two studios were shooting my work simultaneously the same week. I got photos the same day with both casts at two different studios. That was a writer's dream come true. Mm, absolutely, absolutely. And actually, one of the greatest episodes of uh, at least Deep Space Nine for sure. But I would say, arguably, of all Star Trek, of uh, all Star Trek, yeah, thanks. yeah, I'm very, proud of uh, a very, uh, very right for you to be proud of that work because. It touched on so much uh, that, you know, is sensitive to people and talks about, you know, the issue of race, which comes up at the forefront. And uh, I wanted to ask you about um, the scene in which uh, Jake gets killed by the police. What was the what was the uh, impetus for that? Well, originally, in my version, I had um, the character of Worf be a boxer rather than a baseball player. And uh, well, originally it was a story that was gonna happen to Jake, that he was gonna go back and be the writer because they had established that, right, that Jake was a, a nascent you know, oh, yeah. writer. And right. uh, then, but then Ira thought that making it Ben would make it more central to the show, that he was our hero and that they could also have, have uh, you know, him directed as well. But then uh, in, my pi in my outline, uh, once it was, once it was uh, Ben, uh, I had Worf be a boxer who was secretly having a, a romance with a, a white woman who would have been played by, you know, um, uh, what's her name? Uh, the Nana one or Terry? It was um, Terry Farrell, yes. And, uh, and then the cops would get wind of this and basically beat him to death. And so I, still, so I had that incident of someone being beaten to death by the cops. But then I think from that, uh, and I had, I had Jake in it, but he wasn't as, as central. But then Ira chose the idea of him breaking into a car and being beaten and being shot by the cops, which I it was just terrific. I thought it was absolutely right on the money. I mean, everyone, even before we shot it, uh, I had a meeting with the entire writing staff at Nick Adele's restaurant uh, over lunch. Uh, and um, we all knew it was going to be a classic episode. We all knew it was going to be great. Even before the script was written, even before the outline was written, we were just sitting around talking about what it was going to be. We all knew it would be um, a landmark episode. So we were all thrilled by it, Ron Moore, uh, everybody. And, um, you know, Mark, um this, I just got to ask the question that everybody's thinking right now, which is, what was Ronald D. Moore eating at that lunch? I, I, I think it he seems was like a, bur a burger, burger guy. And if I remember correctly, but it was, uh, I might be misremembering mis 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 that. What was it? <laughs> it was something. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you never know. You never know. He was know. sipping a rock to Gino. I, I know that for sure. <laughs> But yeah, so, but it was. We we all knew it was going to be spectacular, and it was every bit. So you originally had him as a boxer and dating a white woman, which is actually like, uh, you know, going back in time. One of the big uh, things with Jack Johnson, one yeah. of the you know the great heavyweights, right? And that was um, the inspiration. That was the inspiration for that. Because for me, having him be a baseball player really didn't do much. Uh, it was it was just kind of like, okay, what what's the point of that? And. Uh, uh, but uh, but I, but that was fine because again the key story was so important and so I mean we watched it with the uh, cast of Discovery a couple of years ago at the um, Star Trek convention and everyone was blown away. It's so much more. It's it's more timely now, sadly, than than twenty years ago. I mean it's it's uh, I mean this is way before the Me Too, uh, you know, the Black Lives Matter or any of that, and you, it hasn't it hasn't gotten tired or or 
or right. old fashioned. It's, it's, it's relevant now, sadly. Sirach, how many times have we brought that up to where not only has yep. Deep Space Nine remained relevant, but oftentimes it's become even more relevant 25 years later? Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. I mean, it was ahead of its time. And that's one of the beautiful things about DS9. You know, talking about terrorism before people were talking about terrorism. Yes. Uh, you know, talking about, uh, you know, issue, these kinds of issues with race and dealing with them head on and not really kind of, you know, and playing around. around with it. Yeah. This is like a direct, let's deal with this race issue. Let's deal with this. And what I think that the cleverest thing that makes it so beautiful is that he's actually envisioning himself as the Cisco character, right? Which is like, it's like a story in a story, which yeah. is what's, what makes the Betty Russell character so uh, interesting too. Well, a point of it, a point of it that we all knew about was the, th the key question of that episode is why is science fiction important? And the reason is because science fiction can, 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 can present a view of the future that makes us rise to that better self. You know, mm -hmm. it's basically, you know, I, I, I talk often about the fact that when Martin Luther King uh, gave his I Have a Dream speech, he was basically telling a science fiction story. He was saying, I see a future where black people and white people sit together at, at the table of prosperity. And, and uh, you know, it was, it, and it didn't exist back then, the table of brotherhood. And, um, and yet by speaking that future, it helped create that future. I mean, when Martin Luther King told Nichelle Nichols right. to stay on Star Trek because it was meaningful, it was important, uh, just think about if he hadn't said that, they would have, you know, she would have quit the show and then they would have cast some white girl or whatever and that right. opportunity would have been lost. And or a so, white dude. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Another yeah, one. Exactly. And, um, you know, so again, I think science fiction is very important because it shows us a possible future. I mean, when Ray Bradbury and Arthur C. Clarke and Heinlein uh, were talking about a, sending a man to the moon, they were working hand in glove with the space program to make the American public uh, want that future of space exploration and, and see it as exciting. They were uh, prophets and, and proselytizing for that. And it, and it made man better. It made us better as a species to, to do those things. So uh, I, I, I don't diminish our genre in any way, shape or form. I don't think it's just escapist entertainment. Right. Makes um, a difference. Yeah. And you know, um, you also have had a really heavy hand in Twilight Zone, which is my other favorite franchise of all time. Really? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Twilight Zone is. I didn't know you were probably Zone. my my single favorite uh, television show. Yes, uh, of all time, actually. Yeah, uh, and I know that you have a lot of knowledge about it, and and have uh, gathered a lot of information about it. What you know, I think that Rod Serling is really uh, a god in the sci-fi business. And did you ever have a chance to work with him or work with people who worked with him? And yes. What's your take on that? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, well, you know, I started writing The Twilight Zone Companion right out of college when I was 21. And uh, I it was two years after Rod Serling's death in 1977. Mm. And I convinced Carol Serling, his widow, to give me full access to everything to let me write the book. So I was literally going through to Rod Serling's house, crawling through his attics, going through attic, going through his files, going through his um, scripts and his screening his film uh, copies of the episode, 16 millimeter prints. It was an amazing experience. And I got to interview everyone who worked on the show, Richard Matheson, George Clayton Johnson, the great writers of the show, the directors, Doug, Doug Hayes and uh, Richard Albert and so forth. And many of them became friends and mentors. And, uh, and then when they brought Twilight Zone back on CBS in the 80s, I actually wrote a script for CBS called Knife, Knife Through the Veil. And Doug, Doug Hayes, who directed uh, Eye of the Beholder and The Howling Man and The After Hours and so forth, The Invaders, he was, uh, was going to direct that episode. And uh, a week before prep, the censors pulled the plug on it. So it was really a, a shame, but that's a, a script I still very much want to make. And I've been talking with um, the Serling estate about doing a show called Rod Serling's After Twilight, where we could do some of the shows that didn't get made back then. Great, so, that's uh, a great title, as you probably already know. That's a good title. Yeah, it'll, it'd be very, very fun. It would be not narrated by Serling because he uh, used to dictate all of his scripts and letters and everything. And they thought all of those uh, recordings were lost. And they've just found 200 of them at uh, wow. three universities. And so, uh, so I'd, I'd love to have that, that show come to, come to fruition. It'd be great. I do would love to see that yes. um, as, as a big fan of Twilight Zone. I think I've watched as, as many episodes as a person can. Um, 
every time I think I've seen, every time I say I've watched all the episodes, some somehow a new episode pops up. So I, I yeah. don't say that anymore. But and um, Mark's about to bring up like two hundred new ones for you. Yeah, <laughs> which is great, and and you got to go through his personal stuff and and I yeah. guess see his notes and and really nice. get a, a glimpse inside his mind. Yes, very much so. And I actually was able to track down videotapes of Rod teaching class in writing where he would bring an episode of The Twilight Zone, screen it, it's a 16 millimeter print, and then talk about it and field questions. And that was just astonishing because that was totally candid. There was no, it was never going to be broadcast. So he could be very forthright and frank. And uh, he was amazingly modest. He was an amazingly funny and, and good hearted man. And uh, uh, I was just so honored to have written that book. And then when I produced the Blu-ray set, uh, I was able to do 52 commentaries on The Twilight Zone. So if you ever want to hear me talk for 30 hours, uh, check out the uh, the commentaries. Because again, I was wow. doing Neil Gaiman. Who doesn't want to hear someone talk for 30 hours? <laughs> People stuck at home yeah. now. Yeah. Are- yeah. That's, exactly That's a good right. point. You're right. Yeah, I guess, I guess yeah. we do want that. Yes. I want to know about this space command uh, and where it, where it came from and what the idea was for that. Sure, you bet. Well, um, a couple of years ago, I uh, I noticed that a lot of the science fiction was being very dark and very dystopic and very grim and hopeless. And uh, and I wanted to do something hopeful, like Star Trek had been for me when I was a kid. Something that said we can we can reach across boundaries and barriers and create a future worth living in, a future that we that our kids would be worth find worth living in. That we mustn't uh, abdicate our responsibility for creating a, a good future, a, a future that includes all of us. And so, rather than trusting the networks or the uh, studios not to cut me off at pilot or cut me off at script, I uh, reached out to my audience. And my audience via Kickstarter campaign campaigns and uh, and selling investment shares for 7500 bucks each has given me over a million bucks and that allowed me to open a studio shoot the first three hours of space command we've just finished the, the first hour and uh, we're about to shoot our fourth hour it's a 12 hour season one and uh, I reached out to my friends Doug Jones Bob Bicardo, Mira Furlan uh, Bill Mummy uh, uh, Michael Harney from Orange is the New Black and Project Blue Book and they all said yes and um, so we just shot it, and the first hour has 900 visual effects shots. Second hour has 900 visual effects shots, and wow. then I learned my lessons. So the third third hour has fewer. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, but it's uh, so we've reopened the studio again. We're building sets. We're building eight foot tall creatures. We're working on visual effects. I mean, right now with the coronavirus, um, we're making sure people are safe. So we're keeping like our visual effects people, our, our editor, are all, they're all working at home. And even our set builders, we're limiting it to one or two people in the studio at a time. So again, we're being very, very careful. And uh, but I, and I actually had an idea. <clears throat> and, and Space Command basically takes place in, in the solar system. Then we jump to the stars. It follows the four families over 150 years as we see what happens uh, to them and to, to all of us. And um, uh, but I've had an idea that now that we're all in lockdown, to do an episode, to create a new episode of Space Command that'll just be from visual effects shots that we've already got, actors performing in their own their own homes with their own cameras, you know, and basically see if we can weave together an episode with people playing their characters. And uh, we're starting to play with it, but I think it would be super cool. And, this, and we would donate. We would, we would donate this to the public. We would not sell it. It would just be for all of us to do something for everyone. Hey, and, Mark, if you want to bring back uh, Lieutenant Sturgeon for that, I've got a green screen right here. I can put a spaceship right behind me, and absolutely. here I am on the shuttlecraft. Absolutely. My buddy, The Rock Smith. Yeah, to me. That'd be great. <laughs> that's, a, that's a great idea. I've never heard that even done before no, or even thought home. about. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I think it'd be great fun, and I think we could do it. And, uh, you know, so def- definitely I'll be uh, reaching out further over the next few days as I nail down what the what the story is, because I first, of course, have to figure out the story. But I think I feel fairly certain I'll be able to. So, uh, but so we also recorded an audio prequel, which we're doing as a graphic novel. So Doug Jones, everyone, all our cast sat in on that and did that, which was great. Um, like that's one of the perks on the uh, the Kickstarter campaign yes. as well, right? Yeah, yeah it's it's uh, forty minutes of a prequel episode. Plus, they've got a uh, video of the behind the scenes of all the people are recording it, like uh, Mira Furlan, a couple others, right? Yeah. Bill Mummy, Bruce Boxleitner, Doug Jones, Mike Harney, everybody, and then I just recorded the uh, uh, video commentary on the first hour, and Ethan uh, McDowell and Brian McClure, two of our stars, just did their audio commentary. So again, with people, again, stuck in their homes, I'm trying to send out content while we have the Kickstarter campaign going, because I know a lot of people are worried about their financial future. So again, 
I'm very aware of that. And obviously, if anyone wants to buy Space Command shares of someone sitting on their on their own island, you know, uh, uh, sitting atop their pile of, of of millions, you know, they're welcome to buy Space Command shares. But uh, but I, we're going to be able to keep going, and we're we're not stopping. I'm not at all defeated by any of this stuff because I, I see science fiction as the great unifier, and I and television. I think of this technology. Here we are. Right now, recording this interview, I've been I, a few minutes ago. I had a meeting with uh, with my investors yesterday. I had a meeting with an uh, an, uh, an executive from Amazon to pitch the show, and this is all via you know Zoom, via the video meetings, and 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 it can be anyone anywhere in the world. So I think we are now linked. I mean, our technology shows us even more so that we're all one one people, that we're all one one family, and. Uh, I think anyone who doesn't recognize that is frankly a fool because it's so obvious. And, uh, mm-hmm. and the coronavirus is, is a definitely a challenge, but on the other hand, it's a world crisis. And there's something, um, I was gonna say something good about that. The good thing is that we are, we're all in it together and we have to rise to the occasion. And, uh, and that's important too. So, you know, and, and, those gonna... of us, and of course, those of us who've grown up with science fiction, this is not a, n- a new situation we've all seen. Right. We just- zombies to start coming up you know because it's we've seen this story a million times you know so yeah. i think this yeah. is going to be a, a case of uh necessity of the, is the mother of invention and if we're we're all being forced to stay at home yes as, as humans human nature is our creative juices are going to start flowing these meetings are going to start happening people are already doing crazy things that are amazing like they're playing outdoor concerts from their balcony you know like there's a guy playing his keyboard out in his balcony and the next person, the next back balcony over is doing a trumpet. Someone's singing yeah. over there. It's just amazing stuff. Uh, before we go on to, cause I do want to talk about He-Man and Smurfs cause I loved those when I was sure. a kid. But sure, before yeah. we do, I did want to ask one last thing about Space Command. What was the thing that you were most pleasantly surprised by when shooting? You know, was there like a performance that just kind of blew you away? Was there... Yeah. Uh, a last second change to the script that turned out really well. Is there? Any- yeah, I was so amazed that you knew your lines. Yeah, yeah I just, I just put the script. I put the script down on the floor. That's why I kept going. I kept going. I think that. Hmm. Yeah. I was actually pretending like I was thinking, but I was really just looking at the script. That was the pleasant surprise of it. <laughs> That's why you're a genius. That's why you're a genius. Um, are you? Are you wearing a Space Command shirt? By the way, is that? Yes, is I that am. What I, yeah. That's 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 a com- nice shirt. That's a comic book. <laughs> oh, that's the comic book. Do you have it on you, or I could grab one? Hang on, one second. Yeah, you can grab okay, one. Okay, that's the okay, that's the comic book. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's the cover. Yeah, that's you're awesome. Doing a graphic novel of the prequel, and so we've we've got the first issue printed. We have a uh, uh, cover for issue two, the cover for issue three. It's just continues. I mean, um, to answer Ryan's question, I think that the biggest uh, pleasant surprise was just the fact that. I, first of all, I got all the actors that I asked, which is right. Grant Jones. I mean, amazing, phenomenal. And uh, the, I mean, it's every day, it's like Christmas for me because I'll get a new visual effects shot or I'll see a scene. Yeah, that's the comic book. I mean, that's nice. William, Stout. William Stout did the cover. He's an astonishing artist. And How then the back cool cover, is that? Is, show the back cover, Ryan, it's by uh, by Ian McCaig, who designed Darth Maul and Queen Amidala. He's our character mm. designer on, on Space Command. And, you know, again, it was just, I asked these guys and they said they loved it. They wanted to do it. And, um, the color is great. So it's so so retro. I love it. It is the retro. It looks like an old school, uh, idea. Yeah, absolutely. The riff on, on the old EC comics, weird science. And, uh, and uh, I just, I just love what I'm doing. You know, we're Space Command is just the start of it. Our plan is to have many series made by our studio. There's Magic Time, which is this big fantasy series that I created that was published as a series of novels. We're going to do that. Um, Christina Moses, who stars in A Million Little Things on ABC, right. she, I cast her as Sulu's daughter. That was her breakthrough role when we did the George Takei episode. She, she, I've written a female lead in, in Magic Time for her. She's going to be in Space Command. You know, I want, I want a lot more. I was going to say people of color. I want more diversity, not less. I want, you know, Farhan to hear his, his family's from Pakistan. That's great. I, He's an incredible actor. That yeah. was- he was a pleasant surprise for me uh, because, I mean, we always know that he's a great actor. We know he's a great guy. Um, but working with him on set, I didn't realize what a prankster he was. Huh. This guy, I mean, because he's he's a fun person in real life and this and that. And he's a professional actor. He was uh, the villain in Iron Man. He was uh, Captain Rabau in the 2009 Star Trek movie. But what yes. I didn't know was that while we're shooting 
and I'm trying to deliver my lines, he'd be under the table giving me a little middle finger to distract me. I didn't know. That. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it loosened us. I'm like, this guy over here is. That's what he pulled a page from Aaron Eisenberg on that one. That's, that's, right. one, <laughs> that's one of his moves. That's right. <laughs> so again, it's like, I, I love the fact that I can, I can see actors whose work I love and just say, come and play in my sandbox. You know, it's just, I mean, it goes back to, you know, uh, let's put on a show. I mean, and that's the, it's so, it's so from the right place. You know, no one said, oh, I think this is what the demographics show, blah, blah, blah. Any of this nonsense about, you know, you see so much TV is crap and it's like, it's crap because <laughs> from their hearts, you know. So, you know, uh, I have a question for you because, you know, this is kind of a, uh, a different approach for you because you're usually hired by the studios, yes. you, you know, they, ha they sign you on as a producer, you may be show running and you're, you're working in that normal traditional uh, fashion. And now you've kind of gone into the, you know, crowds uh, funding yeah. and, and doing your own thing and taking initiative and you, you kind of mentioned uh, taking the restrictions of the studio, not allowing you to do what you wanted to do, you know, past the first episode. Yeah. Uh, what's that like? And what is that? What, what are the things that you're, you're discovering by doing things on your own? Yeah. Well, the biggest challenge was that I had to build everything from scratch. You know, every, like when I would go on to a show like sliders or Friday the 13th, the series or any of the shows I was on staff on, uh, the infrastructure was already there. So I didn't have to raise $44 million to make a season of sliders. You know, I didn't have to build the sets. I didn't have to, you know, I wasn't the whole nine yards. Whereas with Space Command, I had to, you know, rent a warehouse, turn it into a soundstage, choose the designs for everything, write it, direct it, produce it, uh, raise the money. And so it's, but I, I don't regret that because what it gave me was total artistic freedom. I've been very lucky on the shows I've worked on, even. He Man and even Smurfs, I got to write what I wanted to write and they made it and that was great. But you can't um, assume you'll always have that kind of freedom. It's the luck of the draw. And so with Space Command, I was able to cast who I wanted to cast. If I had gone to a network and said, I want to do a show starring Doug Jones, Robert Picardo, Mira Furlan, Bill Mummy, Mike Harney, they would have said, who? And then they would have said, no. <laughs> and then they would have said, here's an actor who just started in some show on the CW and he can't act, but you've got to use him. <laughs> oh, okay, because they're writing the checks. And right. so because they're writing the checks, you can't say no. Right. And uh, you can try and reason with them, and I do. But um, but fortunately, on the shows I've worked on, I've been very lucky. But, but with this, I had a very... Particularly was because back when I started Space Command, things were so relentlessly dark. And, and that was really the... The, the the tone of the time on in television, and I just wanted to say something positive and inspiring because I'm not I don't think that's rose colored glasses I don't think it's naive I think love and compassion are the only things that 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 are a bulwark against evil and darkness that's it you know and without those things you know what what do you have to hold on to so right. that's the way I did it. Yeah. You know, uh, I'm glad that you mentioned Smurfs and He-Man again, because I didn't want to jump into that. Also, of note, you also wrote for Babylon 5, which is pretty amazing, too. You know, that's that's yeah. kind of like the other Deep Space Nine in a lot of ways. Yes. Um, yes. I'm the only writer who wrote for both. I'm the only writer who wrote for both Deep Space Nine and Babylon 5. I also developed Captain Power for television, and that led directly to Babylon 5 uh, via various twists and turns. And uh uh, and I wrote for Real Ghostbusters, which Joe Straczynski's story edited. So again, we have this history that led to a lot of what we've done. So tell us this, because this is this is the question that I really want to know, and maybe like two people out in the whole world. But I just want to know, what is your favorite Smurfs episode and favorite He-Man episode? Okay. My favorite Smurfs episode is one I wrote called It Came From Outer Smurf. I remember and that one, yeah. It's a science fiction episode where an alien lands in the <laughs> And he disguises himself as a Smurf, he, and he uh, he doesn't have a tail, so he takes a pea and he paints it green and he puts it on his butt, and uh, it's just a great episode. It was it was where I was able to basically do a riff on science fiction, so I had a great time with that. And and He Man, whew, well, my favorite episode is one I, I wrote called Reign of the Monster, and the reason was I got a letter from a fan a few years ago. And he said, that's my favorite He-Man episode. Can I send you some frame grabs and could you sign them to me? And I said, sure. 
And then he told me that his father, when he was a kid, his father had gone to a Halloween party and been murdered. And he said that episode of He-Man is what kept him going through his childhood. Somehow hanging onto that allowed him to, to, to keep going. And now he's married, he has a family, he's got a, a career. And he was so grateful that I'd written that episode. So for me, that episode, of course, meant enormously more to him than it meant to me as just having been the writer on it. But I was what so was, glad that had such meaning for him and was of such, a, of such help to him. What was that episode about? I don't remember that one. It was about 30 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Mark's a Cree, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> very good, very good. Dun, dun, dun. Rip, you know, that's a... Oh, it was sorry. Called, it was originally called Reign of the Monster God, but they wouldn't let me use the word God in the title. And it was just about this creature sort of that people worship and it's a monster and He-Man puts it in this place. Pretty, pretty straightforward. It was, uh, I don't, I haven't seen it in God over 20 years. It's, I'm, I'm sure it's brilliant. Yeah. What were you saying, Ciroc? No, I, I, I actually lost my train of thought on that one, but. We got lost I mean, in the thought of God when he says they took uh, off God in the 80s. We're like, yeah, that sounds like well, that. You know what? I'm glad you said that. It brought me back. Um, you have a positive perspective and outlook on life, right? And I think that a lot of people that are in the business for as long as you have been uh, become jaded and a little bit dark. And I noticed that you are not. Uh, mm-hmm. what, not keeps you, what keeps you having an optimistic look and, and trying to be positive and, and giving out these positive messages? Thanks. I, I really appreciate that, que- that question, Sirach. I think it's very, very important. I think uh, John Sayles, who's a wonderful writer of books and films, once said, cynicism is cowardice. And I agree. I think that, mm. that we, uh, fortunately, my mom, I was raised by my mom. She was a divorced mother. And uh, uh, she, um, she was very compassionate and very loving. She had her journey too, which was very one of struggle, but she imparted compassion to me. And as a result, I don't see other people as my competitors. I see other people as my um, allies and my friends and my my family. And so as a result, when someone else succeeds, I, I cheer for them. I, I'm rooting for them. That's why I created my round table that I run of writers and directors and actors and producers. And I see that the world is better uh, if we uh, are positive and loving and come from the heart. And I mean, it's just, I'm glad that it's my nature. Now, also, I was very lucky because I met my wife, Elaine, when I was 20, and we got married when I was 21. So I've been with Elaine for 43 years and married for 42. And she writes and directs and produces with me. And she's a very upbeat person. And my mom was a very upbeat person. And so I'm surrounded by this. And and, and my God, what on earth would I have to complain about or be bitter about? I've, I got to, I got to live the life I wanted to live. I, when I was a teenager, I wanted to grow up to be a writer, producer in TV, making science fiction, writing books on occasion and, uh, and, and meeting my heroes and being friends with them, like Ray Bradbury, who became a very good friend. Uh, you know, I get to write what I want to write, shoot what I want to shoot, cast who I want to cast. Um, the, the whole world is financing me and letting me have my dream. I wake up and every day is like Christmas. I mean, even with the coronavirus, thanks to the technology, we can have this lovely conversation and, and the world can share in it. I mean, there's, there's so many blessings and so many wonderful things every single day. And uh, life itself is a miracle, but I'm, I get to do so many fun things. I get to work with so, so many wonderful people. I mean, I mean, who wouldn't want to work with Ryan Husk, for God's sake? You know, a uh, uh, paragon. The incredible I Husk. Can, I could tell. I can name a few names. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, now, but before, uh, we only have a minute or two left, uh, Mark. But sure. you did mention uh, meeting your heroes. And it reminded me of something that you've said once before, which was how you met Possibly the first time you met a quote hero was how you met Bill Mooney. Do you want to tell us about that? Yes. Well, I was a fan of Lost in Space. This is before Star Trek. And I was like seven years old and I was home with a cold in my pajamas. And I was a latchkey kid. My mom was a working mother. So I was home alone and I decided that I would get out the big phone directory. They used to give this phone directory with all the listed phone numbers, this big, thick white book. And uh, and I decided to look up the stars of of Lost in Space and uh, call them. So I started calling people with the same names as the actors on Lost in Space. And of course, most of them were just different people. They weren't those people. But there was one woman in the phone book, must have been his dad. And I called it and his mom answered. And I said, is Billy there? And his mom said, hold on. And Billy, when we came to the phone, I was so nervous. All I could do was say, will you be my friend and hang up? But then I called him back. That sounds like me asking my first girl out. Yeah, but I called <laughs> him back. And when I was over my cold, my mother took me over to his house and we traded comic books. So we've known each other since we were since I was seven. 
And wow. uh, he got, and I interviewed him when I did the Twilight Zone book, and I worked with him on Babylon Five, and now I'm working with him on Space Command, and uh, he's a terrific guy. So, uh, I mean, so you can tell I was definitely that's the same kind of weirdo when I was a kid. And uh, but it's fun. Like now I have my own channel with Mr. Sci-Fi, and I can share all of these different things with my my fans. So, like we just posted the documentary on the table on Mr. Sci-Fi, and and I have a a piece where I talk about Bill Mummy, and so it just. It just continues. It's uh, I'm still that same kid who who called Billy Mummy when he was seven. I'm not uh, really any different now than 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 I was then. Do you still hang up on people all the time? Oh, <laughs> my favorite things, absolutely yes. Do <laughs> uh, you have any uh, uh, final words, uh, Sirach, before we run? No, you really touched on so much. Uh, I would I, I would ask you about Ray Bradbury, but I feel like that's that can't be answered in under a minute. Uh, I would like to ask you about Jules Verne, but I'm sure that can't be answered in under a minute. Um, so you know, I just I just love to hear your knowledge and to hear your perspective on life, and it's Thanks. really. It's really inspiring for for those of us that get to listen to you and and see that you are living your dream. Thank um, you, Sirach. Well, also yeah. on Mr. Sci-Fi, if you go on Mr. Sci-Fi on YouTube and just type in Ray Bradbury, I did a an hour long commentary about my friendship with Ray, and I'm writing a book called My Ray Bradbury that will be all about how we became friends and what an amazing relationship and, and friendship that was. So uh, mm -hmm. he was one of a kind. Thank God he exists. He was phenomenal. Uh, well, uh, thank you so much, Mr. Mark Zakri. Uh, we do want to say, go check out, everybody go check out the uh, Kickstarter for Space Command Episode 4. As you said, Episode 1 is is done and completed. 2 and 3 have been shot and are in post-production. We're doing Episode 4 right now with all kinds of stars, including John Hennigan, who is Johnny Nitro in yes. uh, WWE Wrestling, which is oh, cool. okay. and, and James Hong, who yes. was uh, Lopan in Big Trouble in Little China. So all kinds of goodies in there. It's really cool people you've, you've assembled there. Uh, thanks so much, Mark. We'll, we'll talk to yeah, you again. Thank you. Okay. And don't forget, I, I also as well will be checking out this Mr. Sci-Fi. I want to know more about it. Great. Thanks a lot, guys. I really enjoyed it. Thanks. Thanks. We'll talk again soon. Sure thank hope you, so. Mark. Thank you. And uh, for those of you at home, always remember the seventh rule.